Good evening, I'm Jim Zirin, and this is The Digital Age. Tonight's show is about Japan, which Secretary of State Clinton is central to Obama's pivot toward Asia, a new foreign policy innovation. The pivot has caused waves across the Pacific, and our question tonight is, what does this new policy bode for the U.S.-Japanese alliance, and what does it mean in terms of our policy toward the Asia-Pacific region? Here to help us answer these questions is an expert in the field. She is Sheila Smith. Sheila Smith has been a teacher, she's been an author, she's been a blogger, and she is the Japan expert at the Council on Foreign Relations. Sheila, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Jim. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, tell us about this pivot. It seems to have upset all the experts on uh, U.S.-Asia <laughs> policy. Well, I don't think it's upset me in the slightest. <laughs> I am delighted at the pivot. And I think the, the message, and it's a very strong message by the Obama administration, the message is the United States remains actively engaged in the international relations, in the economy, in the political relationships of the Asia Pacific. And I think as a Japan expert, a Japan specialist, I can be delighted that they have re-emphasized what has long been American policy, and that is that the U.S.-Japan alliance is the central point of focus for this new Asia-bound uh, Asia pivot. Uh, the reality is, of course, America has always been engaged in Asia. But this is a, just a reassurance to our allies, to our friends, that we are actively engaged, that we will be there for the transformation, the kinds of transformations we're seeing in Myanmar, Burma, for example, that we're going to actively be on the stage as the Asia-Pacific nations gather together to think through the way in which they want their region governed in the future. But of course, the way it's been interpreted, uh, we're pivoting away from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost a basketball term, and pivoting away from the <laughs> Middle East and pivoting toward Asia. Now, uh, can we really pivot from one interest to another? Can we abandon one interest for another? No, I, I don't think we're abandoning our global interests in favor of Asia. But the reality is, and again, the President and the Secretary of State and even our Secretary of Defense, I think, have very clearly outlined the fact that our long-term economic, political, strategic future must must have us engaged in this very dynamic and growing region. Uh, so we cannot uh, abandon our entire global foreign policy on behalf of the Asia Pacific, but rather the Asia Pacific is where our future and our global foundation of strength uh, is going to be derived from. So we have friends, we have relationships, we have an emerging region that is dynamic economically, but strategically and politically has great points of uncertainty. And we have to be there at the table to, to navigate those concerns along with our friends in the region. And uh, just so we can document the source of the pivot, <laughs> uh, Hillary Clinton elaborated uh, the strategy in uh, her article, America's Pacific Century, which mm -hmm. appeared in Foreign Affairs Magazine. And she said, and I quote, as the war in Iraq winds down and America begins to withdraw its forces from Afghanistan, the United States stands at a pivot point. One of the most important tasks of American statecraft over the next decade will therefore be to lock in a substantially increased investment, diplomatic, economic, strategic, and otherwise, in the Asia-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what does this mean for Japan? Well, for Japan, of course, it, it means that its strategic partner, well, United States, is going to be there as, as, as Japan works with its neighbors to ensure stability and prosperity in the region. As you know, Japan lives in Northeast Asia. It's not a very easy neighborhood for Japan, for South Korea, for others as well. And there's several things that are going on in Northeast Asia specifically that are of concern to Tokyo. The first, and this is a, a long-term, decade-long at least problem, and that is the growing willingness of North Korea to, to flout inter the international community and to develop a program of weapons of mass destruction to move in the direction of a nuclear state. Uh, for Japan, of course, that's a dramatic shift for its own strategic calculus. The North Koreans have also proliferated missiles, and in other words, delivery capability that could one day be used, uh, not only against Japan, but potentially also against the United States. So for Japan, if you're sitting in Tokyo, the North Korea threat is the, is the main focus of strategic attention, has been for the last decade. But there's this broader, there's a broader force in, in Northeast Asia, and uh, again, across the Pacific as well, and that is the rise of China. And last year, Japan had a, a rather uncomfortable confrontation with China. The Japanese have sought to collaborate, to cooperate, to work closely with, the, with their Chinese neighbors. But as you know, that, that relationship has been quite fraught and 
and it came to a head last fall. So Th again, this was the incident in the East China Sea That's in right. 2010, and, and involving the fishing vessel. And That's right, and it, it, it seems like a small incident. A Chinese fishing trawler captain uh, refused to get out of Japanese territorial waters. Uh, there's an island there, the Senkaku Islands by the Japanese name, the Daiyu Islands by the Chinese name, but they are uh, contested by the Chinese. Well, now the Japanese just said they want to change the name of it, so <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> which the Chinese uh, <laughs> took umbrage at. <laughs> well, I don't think any, 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 anything to do with the Senkakus is going to make Beijing upset. It's going to make Taiwan upset because Taiwan also has claims. But these are very small islands. They're rocks, in effect. Nobody actually lives there. But it, 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 the territorial waters around these islands, of course, then are uh, uh, claimed by Japan, and they're patrolled by Japanese Coast Guard. So this Chinese fishing trawler, uh, for whatever reason, decided that he was not going to uh, abide by the Coast Guard instructions to leave the waters, and instead rammed them, two uh, um, Japanese Coast Guard vessels. He deliberately rammed into the side of them. Um, in the end, he was detained, his ship was confiscated, his crew was also detained. And that in escalated into a two-week crisis last fall between Tokyo and Beijing that ended up with the Chinese threatening to, or embargoing rare earth minerals, which Japan depends on, uh, arresting Japanese businessmen who are in China, and in getting increasingly bellicose on the international stage about what they might do if Japan didn't surrender the captain. Uh, in the end, the Japanese did return the captain. Um, but it signaled an uh, interaction between the Japanese and Chinese that was very unusual, uh, and it raised it to a new level of concern, not only for Tokyo, but for us and for others around the region, that China was going to put this kind of pressure on countries with which it had these containable, diplomatically negotiable problems with, that in fact they were going to go the route of escalation as opposed to diplomacy. Well, that was uh, 2010, and mm. at the end of uh, 2011, uh, uh, Japanese Prime Minister Noda made right. an historic trip to Beijing, and among the uh, topics on the agenda was uh, uh, the security situation because of the transition of right. power in, in North Korea, and it appeared as though the two countries were going to work together to make sure that North Korea uh, didn't threaten anything uh, against its neighbors. Right, so I think the, ja the Japanese and Chinese uh, government officials both were t are trying to get the bilateral relationship back on a more stable, more normal track. And to tell you the truth, it was not easy in the months after September, October last year through this year. There had been high-level high level meetings, but never a foreign ministerial or a prime ministerial meeting. And that eventually happened this last, um, uh, last fall, last month of 2011. So it took them kind of a year to get this back on track. Well, do you see in that a uh, a Japanese pivot, perhaps, toward, <laughs> toward the Chinese? No, certainly not. And I think it's important for us to remember that Japan has always worked very closely with Beijing, despite the difficulties in the relationship. From uh, the early 2000s onward, though, the two countries have had you know, deep freezes and reconciliation, and now w they went back with this deep freeze in the relationship. This is not an easy relationship for either country. I think the publics in both countries, and I'll speak specifically to Japan here, but the publics in both countries are, are cool in their opinions of each other, and of course the deep this his is, this historical has a history animosity. From World yeah. War II There's and, a deep and even historical before. roots of this, right? Now that China's on the rise, so I think for many Japanese, they feel uncertain about how China is going to work with Japan. Um, they feel that they had don't they had given money and loans and facilitated the economic transitions in China, and yet the Chinese were getting more, um, uh, not hostile, but they were getting more edgy towards the Japanese, not less. But you uh, look at it from China's perspective. I mean, mm -hmm. the Chinese have always been uh, concerned uh, almost obsessively with encirclement, and part mm -hmm. of the encirclement has been Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, they uh, used to have a lot of allies in uh, the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, they had Vietnam, they had Cambodia, they had Burma. Uh, now they're kind of left with North Korea. Burma's uh, out yes. of the tent, yeah. uh, it would seem. So uh, uh, wouldn't it be appear logical they should reach out to Japan mm -hmm. to try to find, a, it's already a trading partner, uh, to find a solid alliance with Japan? And if they did find that, would this be detrimental to the interests of the United States? Well, I don't, again, I don't think either Beijing or Tokyo is interested in an alliance in the way that we typically understand alliance, which is a security uh, relationship. I think what they want 
um, with Tokyo is a predictable and um, warm neighborly relationship. And I, to the large extent, if you to go to March 11th after the earthquake, the Chinese were very quick to respond to Japan's distress. But I think you're, you're still dealing with two Asian giants, neither of which have had another Asian giant to deal with at the same time in history, right? If you go back historically, there's only been one ascendant Asian power in that neck of the woods specifically. At one point it was China, and now it's, then it was Japan, and now China is rising again. So you've got two large Asian powers. And again, proximity matters. They live right next door to each other. So as the economic relationship deepens, and there's still deep support for that in Japan, in the business sector as well as government, um, the economic relationship will always be deep, I think, between Japan and China. But as that continues, the larger question is how China's expanding military power is going to be used, how its political muscle is going to be used, not only in the region, but more broadly, globally. Now, um, Japan has the largest uh, army in Asia, doesn't it? Well, it has the best army in and Asia. And the best army, and best trained, and armed by the United States. Yes, and it is technologically most advanced. But under its constitution, it can't fight. Right. Isn't that right? Well, it has Article 9, which says mm -hmm. it will only use that military in the service of its own defense. And so uh, defense, as you know, is, is in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the question is, to what extent will this put pressure on Japan to really, will Chinese military enhancements put pressure on Japan to up its defense investments, to increase its level of, of security preparedness, and, and to buy more capabilities. The reality is our, our alliance with Japan is really the defense of Japan. We are integrated in all kinds of ways. Our militaries operate closely, ballistic missile defense, maritime strategic defense. Um, the U.S. and Japan are very close allies. And you know they're not quite as in the same format as NATO, but they have a similar kind of understanding of if an attack against Japan happens, the United States will be there to help defend it. So that is the deterrent that the Japanese count on that prevents, that doesn't prevent, but that keeps them feeling secure enough in that uneasy environment to not go for the nuclear option, for example, or to not go in directions of massive military enhancements. So they're watching North Koreans, they're watching China's rise, and they're working more closely with us, the United States, to define strategic areas of cooperation that will keep them secure. Let's examine uh, that a little bit, Sheila. We have the U.S.-Japanese uh, relationship uh, and alliance, mm -hmm. but it's certainly being tested now because of Iran. Right. Secretary of uh, Treasury Geithner went mm -hmm. to Tokyo. Mm -hmm. He thought he had a deal that uh, uh, Japan would stop buying uh, oil from Iran. Mm -hmm. It buys 10 percent of its petroleum from mm -hmm. Uh, Iran refines it in, in Japan, but it buys the petroleum. Um, and then it seemed that the prime minister pulled away from the commitment made by the Japanese finance minister. And we now have a law recently passed that uh, we can take action against uh, foreign banks doing business in, in this country if uh, the, uh, the foreign banks uh, are uh, from a country that um, purchases Iranian oil. So that would impact the Japanese. So how do you see that as playing out? Well, there's several dimensions to the Iran story that are important. And uh, the, the, the current headlines that you're referring to are, are, I think, the finance minister as well as the prime minister now are going through a process of figuring out exactly how Japan can cooperate, what the costs could be, and how the Japanese government might offset some of those costs to Japanese banks. But they're still in their internal process of trying to work through the mechanics of how to, how to implement this. I don't think this is a, I don't think the prime minister pulled back from Minister Azumi's commitment, but rather he said, let's get this worked out in terms of the pragmatic details of how we proceed before we make a, a, a large statement. There's consultations that need to take place, in other words. So I think that's an ongoing process, as it is with our European allies at the moment, as you know. So I think there's, there's not a Japanese lack of interest in cooperation on the sanctions. In fact, the sanctioning support that the Japanese adopted uh, against Iran and the Security Council was one of the models that the Koreans and others used last year. Um, so Japan is fully on board. The question is the costs, and this will be very costly not only to Japan but to the global economy as well. And I think there's a question of balancing here between how you implement these sanctions effectively against Iran, and I think that's what Washington is proceeding with, um, but also in a way that doesn't completely undermine uh, 
all of us who buy oil <laughs> and d depend on the Middle East for supply of oil. So that balancing act is being navigated in Tokyo. Well, it's well. early days because there's right. talk of uh, they're replenishing the uh, right. lost supply from the Saudis when right. Iran threatened the Saudis. Right. And, uh, so the details of all this, th this latest phase of sanctioning, I think, have yet to be uh, to unfold. And I think the Japanese are working hard with our government to try to figure out the best way forward for them. Let's talk about uh, cybersecurity. That's mm -hmm. an issue where mm -hmm. we're uh, cooperating with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. They've had some denial of service attacks, haven't they? They have. And, and they think they come from China? Well, I think everybody thinks they come <laughs> from China. I'm not the expert, <laughs> so I can't tell you exactly where they come from. That's but what's I marvelous <laughs> about cyber attacks. No one knows where they came from. But yeah. the, the assumption, of course, is you know one of the, the um, Japanese consumer electronics manufacturers right, were attacked. Sony had a huge attack, right? Um, the, now the defense industry in Japan has had huge attacks, as well as the government's agencies as well. So, so you know, Mitsubishi Heavy in particular um, was surprised by an incredible attack. But I, I think the reality is in Japan is that working through the cyber issue, they're following Washington's lead in some, in some ways. Um, we have a, an expert at the council who works on this issue quite closely. Um, and probably appeared on this program. He probably <laughs> appeared on the program, and if not, you should have yeah. him. Um, but I think as, as everybody is navigating what cyber means in terms of public-private space, uh, j the Japanese are trying to do the same, and they will have the added complexity, as you referred earlier, to the constitutional prescription of Article 9. And you know, Japan is coming out of a, an experience in World War II where it opened up a lot of its government activities. It, it is now trying to figure out how to balance those civil liberties, dem democratic practices, with the increased need to, to move in this direction. Does the Constitution mention uh, cyber war? No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's subject to interpretation. But the, consti but the constitutional protections on the right of privacy and, and, and these, wi these interpretations of Japan's constitutions are, are quite strong. And so you'll have a, a domestic debate inside Japan that is in part about technology, in part about which institution would be responsible, all the kinds of questions you'd ha you'll have in this country. Since we're on uh, the subject of, uh, of cyber, uh, you have in Japan Facebook and mm -hmm. you have uh, yeah. Twitter. Right. Uh, you don't quite have that in China. Uh, <laughs> yeah. China's had its own problems with uh, the internet mm -hmm. and the state censorship mm -hmm. of the internet. But you had this triple disaster mm -hmm. in March of uh, 2011, right. the earthquake, the tsunami, and then the meltdown at Fukushima. Mm -hmm. Uh, what was the role played by the social media? In, it in was that? phenomenal, and I, you know, I, I tell you, we were at the, the of the day of on March 11th, right, at the council, um, when we knew the earthquake had happened. I was trying to reach people in Tokyo, and like everybody else, you could get through to nobody, no landlines, no nothing. We had fr I had friends on the ground, um, and they, they, everybody was in the Japan community was trying to, you know, get information through, and basically. It was the social media. It was the cell phone providers in Japan themselves. Google had a lost person finder site up immediately. Um, so the internet, and then in subsequent hours, days, weeks afterwards, once the cell phones and the landlines were all set back up again, y you watch this entire conversation about the disaster, the details of the disaster, you know, the nuts and bolts of search and rescue, supply, what's going on up there. All of that took place on social media. It was, there were sites across the board. I wrote a blog piece on, on at one point, sharing some of those sites in translation. Um, people were commenting on um, who was doing the right thing. They were commenting on Mr. Edana, who was chief cabinet, sec you know, cabinet secretary at the time, saying, oh, he looks so tired, poor guy, he needs to take a rest. You know, th there, there were all kinds of communications going on there. It was a very powerful venue especially for younger Japanese, to be part of understanding that they had a role to play, not only in just assessing the situation, but perhaps in going up to Tohoku to volunteer, in figuring out what the people up in that region that got so hard, badly hit um, needed. So the volunteerism really depended on those, that social media. The nuclear meltdowns at Fukushima Daiichi, a lot of the communications were also, you know, there's a lot of speculative communication to be sure, but there was a lot of day-to-day -day measurements of radiation. Who is, you know, the evacuees were 160,000 people were evacuated, right, at least uh, in the initial days. Where was everybody? Where were they finding homes? How could they get in touch with each and other? And what's the current situation? Are the plants down in Fukushima? The plants now are, um, now it's all open to the public. The, me the media has gone in. Um, of course, you know, bef even before that, 
uh, experts from IAEA and others had gone in, but, but the media went in last, late last year, and to the government declared by the end of the year that the reactors were in, in shutdown mode. And are there still uh, survivors of uh, the earthquake and the tsunami who are in camps? Or, uh yes, there's probably, uh, today I think there's probably somewhere between 50 and 60,000 people are still displaced, not including the Fukushima uh, evacuees, which they are pretty much permanently displaced for now, or at least for the next I don't know, year, several years. Um, but the people who lost their homes up further from the tsunami damage, there are still people in temporary housing. Um, that will happen until the cities, the coastal areas get rebuilt. The grand total as of this morning, of course, is about 15,000, 16,000 deaths, and there's still 3,400, 500 declared missing. Um, so it's just under 20,000 total it, of loss for Japan. But you're, you're in a phase now in those coastal cities to varying degrees, depending on what town or village you're in, um, of rebuilding. People are in temporary housing. They're trying to figure out what kind of configuration they want for their city, town, or village. Uh, do they want to go back to t coastal areas and live? Do they want to rebuild up on high plateaus? How do you navigate property rights? You know, you've got this whole municipal area that now is going to get transplanted somewhere else. How are you going to do that? Um, so the principles, the community building, the, the very strong impulse, I think, of many of the Tohoku residents to go back to live where they came from, even though it was so deeply devastating, I think that is, that, that's kind of leading the way of government efforts to design a, a more resilient community for disasters going forward. Okay, Sheila, let's move on to uh, Japan's domestic political situation, okay. because it has <laughs> always seemed to me that every year we get a new Japanese prime minister. And do, the last actually. one, uh, uh, Mr. Khan, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, certainly had a stormy administration. He uh, just barely survived yeah. a vote of no confidence. Uh, then we now we have Prime Minister Noda, who mm -hmm. comes from the financial sector. He really has no background in foreign affairs. And no sooner is he inaugurated than he travels to Beijing, and then he travels to Delhi, and there seems to be a spasm of diplomatic <laughs> activity. What do you make of all this? What, tell us about Mr. Noda. Mr. Noda. Mr. <laughs> Noda describes himself as, um, he uses this term, when, when he was running for the presidency of his party, the DPJ, he used this term, um, it's a loach, and we, I have no idea wh who is listening to our broadcast, who will understand what a loach is, but it's something like a catfish, okay? It's a kind of fish, it's not very sexy, it's you know quiet, it goes about its business, but it gets things done, right? So he says, I'm not a goldfish, I'm a loach, okay? So he's very self-deprecating in terms of the way he presents his himself, but he has a very strong, you, when you meet him, you the Chinese get would say, Biden hide. <laughs> 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 well, he's, 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 he's <laughs> yes, exactly. He's not quite that style. <laughs> he's a kind of matter of fact. Let's get things done. I, this is my focus, and this is where I'm going. And I, I think he's basically said to the nation, "Look, you've had triple disasters. Japan has had the worst year it has ever had. You've had the DPJ, our party, his party, um, unravel." dissolving DPJ itself. DPJ is Democratic Party of Japan. Exactly, it's a ruling party. And this is the new party that came in in 2009 after a half century of single party rule by the conservatives, right? So this is a brand new political party. They've never governed and it showed, frankly, <laughs> at the beginning. They didn't have a lot of experience. And he says, look, our, 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 our party rattled Japan's government and I'm here to put it back on track. I'm here to take you safely. What I am going to do is stay steady, move forward in a consensus-oriented kind of way to build confidence in Japan's governance again. So I initially he had, I thought he hit exactly the right tone for the Japanese public. Today his support ratings again. He's down in the polls. He's down in the Wants polls. Wants to raise right. the sales tax. And he says, I'm going to go a la Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to go after their fiscal problems. And you know, a lot of people would say he has, he's got to go after more than the consumption tax, but he's at least going to start to raise revenues and the consumption tax is the place he's going to go first. Well, this is important for them because they want to reduce their debt, even right. though their debt isn't held uh, by foreign It's all held by countries, Jap it's all by Japanese. To date, although the Chinese are starting to you know. poke around in there, frankly, but, but it's 200% of GDP. It's, it's, it's extraordinarily high. So unless they address this now rather than later, they will five to six to seven years from now have a fairly severe fiscal crisis, right? Um, maybe not a la Greece, but they will be in trouble. Uh, so it needs to, it needed to be addressed several years ago, not, but they've had these political challenges. So Nola comes in, 
Um, I don't know if he's had a fiscal back. He was the Minister of Finance, so he did come from the Ministry of Finance. So the finance bureaucrats got to teach him um, a few things before he headed for the Prime Minister's office. Well, it seems so interesting that he, being with his financial background, now, of course, so much of uh, foreign policy mm -hmm. these days is economic, economic right. Right. Uh, but uh, that he's focused on uh, bringing back the, uh, the six-party talks, which involve uh, Japan, China, North and South right. Korea. Right. in the United States uh, in order to talk about North Korea's yeah. nuclear potential. So he is uh, he's really engaging right. all over the world. Right. Um, and uh, it seems, given his background, uh, mm -hmm. somewhat uh, striking. Mm. Well, he's, you know, the, the, you mentioned the difference between him and former Prime Minister Khan. He, he can't comes in not with this idea that Japan and China are going to be close, you know, and closer than Washington and Tokyo. But rather that, that, that he's got a new idea that he's going to unfold called the Pacific Charter, which may sound a little familiar to those of us listening to, to the Obama administration's Pacific Century, right? Um, but he sees China as absolutely crucial to Japan's future, but he wants a win-win relationship with China. So a win-win relationship. Yes. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up. <laughs> so I want to say, Sheila Smith, thank you thank so much you. for coming My by. My pleasure. I could ask you a question. Is Japan central to Obama's pivot toward Asia? Absolutely. 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 <laughs> and thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at digitalage.org. For the Digital Age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.